minority disparities in academic medicine, uh, but also in other uh, career sectors as well, because we know that it affects everyone uh, throughout all these different uh, career opportunities. Uh, we're very excited to have a powerhouse of speakers today, Dr. Dean Nancy Brown from Yale, uh, Dr. Joy Wu from Stanford, and also Dr. Bernard from the NIH. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of background, then I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers. I'm going to share my screen here. Highlight some of the advocacy efforts that APSA has been engaged in uh, to try to address challenges facing the physician scientist community, but also uh, women and underrepresented minorities. So uh, for the physician scientist pipeline, we know it's a very leaky pipeline, uh, even more so for women and underrepresented minorities, or one can even argue that they don't even enter this pipeline to begin with. Um, so we're very grateful and excited to have this panel here to help us uh, review what are the current state of affairs in terms of women and underrepresented minorities and the disparities that face them, uh, but then also what are potential solutions, which our current speakers have been actively engaged in, in, in trying to address these issues. Uh, so we, most of the uh, speakers and probably attendees here are aware of the disparities that exist in terms of publications, citations for women, uh, promotion and tenure, uh, salary, you know, issues with getting grants and even startup support. Uh, some of this includes issues with discrimination and subconscious biases that people may not even be aware of. So way back, uh, even in 2008, we wanted to start an initiative to try to address uh, the uh, a promotion issue with women in medicine, despite the fact that uh, women make up about 50% of medical students, but as you continue to go up the ranks of academia, their numbers go lower and lower. Um, and we have tried to assess these various things that contribute to uh, this decrease in the promotion of women in academic medicine. Uh, we did a pilot survey and a national survey to try to assess what could be some potential factors. We first started off with the, at the trainee level, but now we're starting to move on to the early career as well and do some education and advocacy. So our net nationwide survey, uh, we assess different perceptions from pre-doctoral MD and MD PhD trainees and identified that there's actually a unique cohort of MD uh, who are interested in doing research intense careers, but those uh, cohorts face unique challenges compared to their MD, trainee, MD PhD colleagues. Um, and I think the numbers overall may be getting a little better uh, from 2007 and 2008 uh, AAMC data compared to the 2018, 2019. So for example, uh, back here, full professors, 25%. It was less than 20% back in 2007, 2008. Department chairs, uh, back then it was about 12%. Now it's 18%. Deans, you know, 10%. Uh, now it's 18%. So maybe this is improving over these uh, more than 10 years, but certainly more work can be done. So we also looked at women and underrepresented minorities in that large uh, study where we garnered more than 4,000 responses. Um, and we saw that uh, the underrepresented minorities face unique challenges and the women uh, were less likely to intend research careers. However, if you looked at the MD-PhD subcohort, there was no significant difference in terms of their intentions for research careers. However, the challenge is to trying to retain them at this point. Uh, so this was kind of the summary results from the URM study. Fewer African-Americans were intending academic and research careers, particularly basic and translational research. Um, more African-American trainees describe experiencing discrimination and bias, um, addressing systemic uh, discrimination processes, increasing funding topics that African-Americans are more likely to research, advocacy health disparities will be an important component of that. They also expressed more issues with loan repayment. They also said that they were more likely to have to be a caretaker or provide financial support to others. Um, and they also endorsed that mentorship was very important to them, more so than the other ethnicities uh, in, in terms of their career. And the women one, they were more less likely to intend basic and transitional research careers, and also more likely to have already experienced discrimination and bias in their uh, early career. So then enter COVID, and the pipeline was leaky before, but as we know, with long COVID, all the complications associated with COVID, uh, all the social isolation and stress that has arised from this pandemic, 
we know physicians and scientists are more crucial than ever. You know, they'll be crucial for therapies, vaccines, prevention strategies, et cetera. Uh, but due to low grant funding rates, grant uncertainty, trying to balance or research clinical demands, uh, persistent economic misalignment of incentives. Um, and I know this is better now. Uh, there were hiring freezes that initial year, um, but they still have persistent increased caregiving demands. Um, so we developed this initiative uh, with Dr. Nock, and uh, we led this national study uh, that was launched during that first peak, so April to June 2020. Uh, we garnered more than 2,100 responses across the, uh, across the country with more than 120 institutions. Um, and we also did a parallel study with our European colleagues with uh, samples from UK, France, Italy, Netherlands, and Switzerland, 109 responses. They also had similar uh, issues with stress and decreased productivity as well. We also resurveyed one year out, uh, June to August, 2021. So the stress during the first peak was very high and women were independently uh, associated with increased risk of stress compared to their male colleagues. Uh, and on follow-up one year out, unfortunately, the stress levels are not much better. Uh, these were some of the variables that were associated with increased uh, reporting of stress, including social isolation, their productivity being affected, personal life being affected, if patient care was being affected. So this was actually at the resident fellow level. And for faculty, training being affected, research being affected, personal life being affected. Um, and on follow-up, it was not much better one year out. We were still 85% endorsed stress. Um, and in terms of productivity for re resident fellow faculty, 65% uh, endorsed that they had their productivity adversely affected during that initial peak of the pandemic. And the variables that were associated with saying this particular outcome included personal life being affected, patient care being affected, research scholarly activity being affected, dual uh, career being affected, and dual degree was here as well. Um, and then faculty, kind of similar variables associated with the impaired productivity outcome. And on follow-up, unfortunately, it looks like uh, the productivity being affected had actually increased at one year out. And what about some of the work-life issues uh, that are being affected at our resident fellow faculty level? So we stratified this by senior, intermediate, junior faculty. Um, the intermediate and junior faculty said their labs were not working. Uh, the intermediate and junior faculty said that they had lost childcare or that they were taking care of their own children. Um, and then patient care, more of the intermediate and junior faculty were taking on a brunt um, of those obligations. And then this during the first peak, a lot of the residents and fellows uh, were concerned about not being able to find a job. Um, and then at that first uh, peak as well, more females in the comments said that they had to take on a majority of the home and caregiving needs uh, compared to their male colleagues. And in fact, uh, several of the male colleagues expressed concern that their female colleagues uh, were going to be lost during this pandemic and that they were concerned that we're going to lose a generation. So I think uh, both genders feel that the females are actually, you know, experiencing more of the pressures. Um, and then on follow-up, uh, the resident fellows, uh, fa faculty, only 23% said that uh, they would not be able to find a job. So that has dropped um, when you're out. Uh, for the URM, they expressed higher stress levels uh, concerning about their own health. I think this in part reflects some of those initial studies showing that underrepresented minorities were more likely uh, to have severe COVID or have uh, higher rates of infection. Um, and then also fewer of them had, were spending time on data analysis. So one metric of potential uh, productivity being impaired. Um, and then one other important question that we asked in our follow-up survey one year out was, uh, what were their personal priorities since the pandemic started? What has increased in importance? And you can see that friends, family, personal health, time with partner, time with children, these were the top four things that had gone up in priority, but career success and research were not the top things that went up for them. Uh, so this suggests that policy and institutional changes are needed to help retain talent with COVID as the new normal. Some more flexible tenure uh, promotion uh, metrics, as well as maybe in grants, uh, some more flexibility uh, in grant deadlines as well. Uh, and then uh, this was our advocacy efforts. So we actually try to advocate uh, to the House and the Senate to try to increase funding and also increase some of the setbacks uh, due to research uh, to try to incorporate the support into the RISE Act, which unfortunately still has not really been approved. It's kind of been on the back burner. 
uh, but we spoke with numerous House of Representatives and senators to relay some of the data that we saw from our studies uh, to show them like we need physician scientists more than ever, and yet we're at risk of losing them. Uh, we also were invited by Representative DeGette's team, who uh, is one of the co-authors of the RISE Act and Cures Act 2.0, to contribute some policy to Cures Act 2.0. So we actually wrote uh, some policies to increase dedicated funding to physician scientists. Uh, we wrote a editorial piece in The Hill, which is a very popular uh, news outlet uh, for DC buffs. It's like one of the third uh, most read um, editorials in the country, particularly for policymakers. Um, and uh, along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Brandt at University of Michigan, uh, this got a lot of traction. And, and I think that really helped with some of these advocacy efforts. So uh, NIH, uh, thanks to Congress, they increased the budget. Obviously, I know a lot of other people are advocating for this, uh, but uh, talking to our research colleague, Research America colleagues and FASEB, they said that you know your efforts really helped contribute to some of these uh, increases as well. So that's really you know helpful and, and reassuring to hear that you know a lot of advocacy efforts um, can become fruitful. But they did increase the NIH budget by 3.5 billion. Um, they through the NIH Director's uh, Budget Office, they also increased funding for female researchers um, as well as 0.7 billion to the Minority Health Initiative, um, and and people know about the three billion uh, to ARPA H. And for the cardiology colleagues, um, they increased it by 5.5 uh, billion to the NHLBI. So now we're gonna go uh, to our speakers. I'm gonna stop share here. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Dr. and Dean Brown. Let me see if I can fix it here. All right, so Dean Brown, uh, she is a graduate of Yale College. She's led an uh, extensive translational research uh, program that has uh, focused on developing new pharmacological strategies to prevent vascular disease in patients with high blood pressure and diabetes. Throughout her career, she has promoted uh, the development of physician scientists. Uh, she's led many initiatives at Vanderbilt to support the infrastructure of physician scientists to transition to independence. In 2010 to 2020, she served as the chair of the Vanderbilt Department of Medicine and physician chief of Vanderbilt University. She's a member of the NIH National Ad Advisory Research Resources Council and the NHLBI Advisory Council. Her research has been recognized by the AHA um, and numerous other organizations. Uh, she's also a member of AAAS, ASCI, AAP, and also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So without further ado, I'm gonna let uh, Dean Brown give us her insights. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'd like to start by talking about the sort of never events that I think we need to um, prevent in that, that sometimes stall careers and then talk about how we, and particularly addressing this to leaders in academic uh, institutions, support our young physician scientists to advance those who are, of, uh, who are underrepresented in medicine or women. And, and so the first thing is, you know, it, it's hard to become a physician scientist. Um, it, it is a great career um, and one that gives people a lot of joy and satisfaction, but you have to get past those initial uh, difficult years. And they're difficult because people have debt, uh, you've gone through long periods of clinical training, and there's uncertainty about, about funding until you really um, become uh, skilled at writing grants and those sorts of things. So it requires mentorship, but it also requires a persistence and a resilience. And ultimately what I would say is an emergence of self-confidence. And that emergence of self-confidence is hard to come about if you're in an environment that does not feel inclusive. And particularly if you're in an environment where there may be overt sexism or racism, and then you know, at best some subtle biases uh, and microaggressions. So um, if you then add on top of it, those feeling on top of now feelings of isolation or inadequacy, um, distractions like institutional expectations around citizenship, um, competing family co commitments as uh, Jennifer just described, financial concerns, it's, it gets pretty tough. So I think at the very minimum, we all have to eliminate those microaggressions and those overt isms um, that Create a non-inclusive environment, and um, you know it. It requires that we have uh, 
very uh, easy systems for reporting, that we have confidentiality, and also that we have due process so that um, those who are affected uh, have, have uh, a confidential process that's expeditious and also fair. We also have to train our leaders to give them the tools to um, have difficult conversations and to hold faculty accountable or staff or whoever it is. So th that's the minimum. And uh, I think many of us have spent time doing that at Yale. We've um, stood up an office of, of professionalism, leadership development focused at that work. Then the next thing that we have to do is foster a culture of success. And, you know, in terms of increasing uh, diversity and inclusion for our physician scientists, I think in the past we have often focused on recruiting. We really need to also focus on retention. You know, so today when we look at our medical school classes, you know, at Yale, 28% are underrepresented in medicine, 50% are women. How do we retain people in academia and particularly in research? For uh, residents and trainees, it's often a matter of nurturing curiosity and making people aware of, of career resources, again, instilling in them some self-confidence, but it's a matter of what I would call proactive retention, identifying those who have an interest in research and investing in them from a very early period whether that's in residency. Um, so these are, you know, I think those of you who are MD, PhDs, which is most of the people in the audience, you, you start your careers with an interest in research, but we also have a lot of late bloomers who go into their residency and become excited about something and we need to grab them as well. So what does it take to help somebody advance from the training period into an independent investigator? It requires a departmental commitment of adequate protected time and resources. It requires that we oversee mentorship and individual development plans. So lots of people have mentors, but when you talk to them, maybe they're not meeting with their mentorship committee or they're not getting resources. And it requires that um, they have the ability to participate in activities that demystify the process, that make grant writing transparent and easier, internal study sections, um, access to successful grants. So that for uh, that is for everybody, but those activities, in my experience, have a disproportionate benefit for our women faculty and those who are underrepresented in medicine. And there are a couple of other things that I would mention that have a disproportionate benefit. So mentorship is really important, but so is sponsorship. That is the, the notion that we connect people with uh, a network, that we recommend them to give talks, that we help them become known in their given fields. And the literature would suggest that sponsorship, again, has a disproportionate effect for the groups that we're talking about today. And the last thing I would say again, is this notion of, of proactive retention. Meeting with people regularly to let them know that we value them and that we want to invest in you and find out what their needs are. That has a huge impact in retaining people. By the time somebody is talking to other institutions or is thinking about giving up on research, it's often too late. So we need to do that in the early days. Um, I would say specifically around COVID because you raised it, uh, you know, I, you're absolutely right, disproportionate effect. And um, one of the things that we have done is invest uh, in gap funding. We did this early in the very first uh, surge of the pandemic to give people a little walking around money to get some primary data, some, some um, preliminary data to renew their grants and actually the return on that has been phenomenal. So it was several millions of dollars, but what we've seen is that among our women and our, our faculty who are underrepresented in medicine, actually a greater increase in the number of publications than we saw in our majority in our male populations. Now we need to make sure that we carry that through in terms of writing grants as people, uh, I think, delayed grant writing during the pandemic. But those are a few thoughts about the things and I, if, you know, in the 
question and answer. I can talk about specific things we're doing at Yale, but a few thoughts there. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Brown. Appreciate your insights. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Joy Wu. She's an associate professor and vice chair of basic science in the Department of Medicine at Stanford University, where she directs a basic and transitional research program that focuses on skeletal development and stem cell therapies for the bone. Uh, she has practiced clinical medicine in the Stanford Osteoporosis Clinic and has served on several guideline committees related to cancer and bone health. She earned her MD and PhD degrees at Duke University, followed by internal medicine residency at Brigham and endocrinology fellowship at MGH. She currently serves on the board of directors of the Endocrine Society. Welcome, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. It's really a privilege to be here with Dean Brown and Dr. Bernard. Um, and I wanna applaud APSA for its advocacy in this very important area. Um, okay, do you see my slides? Yes. All right, fantastic. All right, so I went to medical school in the 90s. Um, and at the time, there were very few women in the very senior leadership roles, uh, but there was a great deal of optimism. Uh, already by about 1989, women represented more than 40% of the applicants to medical school. And there was the sense that things were really on the rise. And um, indeed, the number of women attending medical school has been close to 50-50 now for uh, over 20 years. And yet, despite that, as Dr. Kwan mentioned in her introduction, Gender equity has remained uh, a challenge and frustrating to achieve in medicine, even after all these years. Um, and so while we have 48% of medical school graduates, um, as we've seen by full professors, this number is down to 25% um, and even lower uh, at the level of department chair and dean. There are many reasons for this. Women face various biases and barriers in medicine. Um, and in the next few slides, I'd like to share some of the data behind these challenges. But first, a few caveats. Gender is not binary, I want to acknowledge that, but most of the data and studies that have been published to date have represented gender as a very binary construct, um, and hopefully we'll do better going forward. The other thing I want to say is that often when I share these data, uh, frequently on Twitter, uh, I will hear back from usually young women that they find the data depressing, discouraging, um, and, and I understand that, uh, but I want to encourage people to maybe reframe and to use the data as a form of a superpower. Because one thing that happens to women and underrepresented minorities is not only do they expect, experience bias and barriers, but they experience gaslighting. They're told that these are just imagined, it's not such a big deal, don't be so sensitive. Uh, and so I think really having evidence-based data to discuss this is what we need to move the field forward. All right, so let's talk about some of the disparities. Women in medicine are paid less than men. The uh, reasons given are usually that uh, men are uh, more likely to be in more lucrative specialties. Men might see more pa uh, patients. Men are at higher ranks uh, at greater proportions. Um, and yet among early career physician scientists, those who hold K08 and K23 uh, awards from the NIH, even after you uh, adjust for all of these factors, men are paid on average $13,399 more than women. Women have less time available for research. At work, women spend more time on things like service, teaching, mentoring. Uh, there's also what's called the minority tax. So women and underrepresented minorities are asked to serve on diversity committees and uh, things like that. Um, women spend more time with their patients in the clinic. At home, women spend much more time on domestic chores and childcare. And in another study of K08 and K23 holders, uh, this averages to 8.5 hours more per week than men. Promotions in academic medicine are typically um, tied to so-called national or international reputation. And the metrics for this include things like being an invited speaker, grand rounds, winning awards, being elected to honorary societies, and yet for every one of these metrics, women are underrepresented. Even after you account for all of these differences, women are promoted at a lower rate than men. Um, and this is from a recent study showing both promotion to associate or full professor. And perhaps the most frustrating aspect is that even over 35 years, there's been no evidence that this gap is narrowing over time. So if you look at the cohort 35 years ago and today, 
the rates of promotion are still um, exhibiting quite a disparity. On top of all this, women experience gender bias and sexual harassment at far greater proportions than men. And this is severe enough that the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine issued a report in 2018 um, and had what I thought was a very useful infographic showing that it's not just the overt sexual co coercion or harassment that happens, but all of the underlying gender bias, innuendos, microaggressions. I want to make the case that women physician scientists not only face these barriers that I've just discussed in medicine, um, but they also face the barriers in science as well. And this is a problem because physician scientists already are only about 1.5% of the overall physician workforce. This has been dwindling over the last few decades. And it's estimated that women represent approximately a third of NIH funded investigators. So you can do the math and see that women physician scientists are indeed an endangered species. Some of the biases include um, biases uh, from science faculty that favor men. So this was a, a famous study in which a application for a laboratory manager was sent to faculty at research intensive universities. And the application was identical, except that it came from either John or Jennifer. And John was consistently rated as more competent, more hireable, more deserving of mentorship, and was offered a higher salary. Your chances of becoming an assistant professor are probably greater if you train in a so-called elite lab. Um, and that's a lab maybe where the professor is a Howard Hughes investigator, a member of the National Academy, or a winner of a major award like the Nobel or Lasker. And yet men elite faculty train fewer women uh, than men. The same is not the case for an elite female faculty. It takes a lot of money to get a lab up and going, um, and there's a great disparity in startup funding. So one study showed that men on average receive $800,000 uh, in startup, whereas women receive about $350,000. And this disparity is largely driven by differences in startup packages to PhD or MD PhD scientists in the basic research fields. So not surprisingly, a recent editorial in Cell reported that only 17% of manuscripts that are published in Cell are submitted by women. At the risk of uh, maybe oversimplifying or trivializing this, um, if promotions in academic medicine were as straightforward as a video game in which you just had to collect coins to level up, and I want to acknowledge that it's not that simple, women have fewer coins available, so a bias in opportunity. These coins would be harder to find, so a bias in recognition. And on top of all that, women would be asked to collect more coins to achieve the next level, so a bias in promotion. Not surprisingly, this can feel like to women that they have to run the gauntlet uh, and women end up leaving medicine at much higher rates. So in this study, by six years out of residency, there's a very substantial decrease in the number of women. The same is true for STEM fields overall. In the years after their first child, almost half of women leave full-time STEM employment. And we have to ask what we're losing when we allow women to leave. While it is true that women here to publish fewer papers early in their career, later on, they really um, have a boost in productivity. So we're, we're losing this if we don't retain women. And as has been mentioned by both Dr. Kwan and Dr. Brown, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a really disproportionate impact on women. This has been demonstrated in the literature um, in terms of fewer publications by women, um, either to journals like Lancet or in fields like cardiology and pediatrics. At Stanford in the Department of Medicine, we tracked grant proposal submissions, reasoning that this would be sort of a real-time indicator of how um, our men and women faculty were doing in terms of time for research. And over the first 12 months of the pandemic from April 2020 to March 2021, compared to the previous 12 months period, we found that our men faculty increased proposal submissions by 20% over this time, while women faculty actually fell by 2%. So how can we stop this leak? 
Dr. Brown has given some great suggestions, at, uh, especially, especially the institutional level for mentoring physician scientists. I want to start with some individual actions that we can all take. I think we can all do our part to make things better. And I want to start with allyship. Um, and so the idea that everybody can be supporting those who are in different circumstances. We can educate ourselves on unconscious bias, how to be an upstander. Um, I want to highlight the Right to Be Org uh, is a great site for training on um, interventions if you see somebody being submitted to harassment or microaggressions, understanding the challenges that are faced by those who have different circumstances. It's important to invite different viewpoints to the table. I love this quote by uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. Dr. Brown has uh, mentioned the importance of mentorship and sponsorship. And then you can do your part to make sure that non-research tasks at work, so committee assignments, planning events, mentoring students, um, and then at home with your partner or spouse, make sure that those tasks are being shared fairly. Um, and then advocacy, uh, Dr. Kwan gave some great examples of how APSA has been involved, and I think we can all get involved in that as well. I wanna highlight in allyship, um, the, we are the part one panel, um, and part two happens on Friday. Um, and I'm particularly proud that uh, my chairman, Robert Harrington, um, as well as our department's special advisor for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Arga Gonzalez, will be two of the panelists along with Diana Lautenberger from the AAMC. And just to highlight what allyship can do, Dr. Harrington has been our chair for um, about 10 years at Stanford and has utterly transformed our leadership. So this is just a screenshot of our vice and associate chairs in the Department of Medicine. And you can see that there's a wonderfully diverse representation Eight of 17 of our vice and associate chairs are women. Um, and as of next month, a third of our division chiefs will be women. And this is all because one individual, Dr. Harrington, really made this a priority. So allyship can be incredibly important. And finally, to close, I just want to mention a couple other things that I think institutions and societies can be doing. I was invited by the Clinical Research Forum, which is an organization that supports um, all things relating to clinical research to join an academic committee, to address the issues of the pandemic on women and their academic productivity. And we recently published a framework for action in nature medicine in which we identified a number of actions that could be taken at the institution level, as well as by professional societies and funding bodies. These include things like Dr. Brown mentioned, financial um, uh, interventions, research support, um, making sure startup packages are comparable, uh, helping faculty with childcare and elder care. We have to work on the culture to make sure that gender equity is valued and promoted by all. Uh, we can do it operational things like ensuring mentorship and sponsorship. Um, and then at the society and uh, funding level, we can make sure that funding bodies also prioritize these kinds of activities. And so with that, I'll stop and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Doctor. We really appreciate that uh, tour de force review of the most current literature and also the uh, helpful solutions uh, that can be done at all levels uh, from institution up to the government. So our next speaker is Dr. Marie Bernard. She's at the NIH. She's the chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. She leads NIH thought uh, processes regarding the science of uh, scientific workforce diversity, assuring the full range of talent is assessed to promote scientific creativity, innovation, both intramurally and extramurally. Uh, she also co-leads NIH's new announced UNITE initiative to end structural racism. Prior to being selected as the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, in May 2021, she was the deputy director of the NIA. As NIA's senior geriatrician, she served as the principal advisor to the NIA director. She also led a broad range of activities, including co-chairing two Department of Health and Human Sciences Healthy People 2030, uh, 2020 objectives, older adults, dementias, including Alzheimer's disease. And she co-led the NIH-wide inclusion governance committee that ensures appropriate inclusion of individuals in clinical studies 
including by sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and inclusion of children and older adults. Uh, she also led the Women of Color Committee of the NIH-wide Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. Her national leadership in geriatrics research, teaching, and clinical practice has been recognized by Clark Tippett's Award from the Academy for Gerontology in Higher Education, as well as numerous other, numerous other awards, including NIH Director's Awards. So without further ado, Dr. Bernard. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to um, follow um, uh, my two colleagues because um, really the three presentations have set things up very nicely for the overview I'd like to provide of what NIH is doing in this space. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about why we think diversity of the scientific workforce is important, what we've seen in terms of the COVID pandemic and what, what we've done about that, and then talking even more broadly about what we're trying to do to make sure that we have diverse voices at the table as we move the science forward. So what is the case? Uh, as in a nature medicine commentary that we had in November of uh, 21, we make the point that the challenges in biomedical science are like trying to describe an elephant without sight. You have to approach it from a lot of different perspectives uh, to get a full sense of what is really going on. And there's a lot of data out there to support that. There's this wonderful study by Freeman and Wong looking at some 2.5 million uh, published articles to look at the impact of, uh, or the journals that they got published in, the impact factor of the journals and the frequency with which they were cited. And what they found is uh, if authors were of the same ethnicity, they had an algorithm for determining that not a perfect tool, but consistently applied, um, they, they would develop a homophily index. Uh, and the more homogeneous they were, the higher the index. And in fact, the, the, the lower the impact factor of the journal in which the study was published all the way through to a 10 author study uh, with low homophily index and high impact factor journal. Of course, the sort of science that gets published uh, with 10 authors versus two authors is likely very different. But even when they looked at it from the standpoint of geographic diversity, the addresses of the authors or information diversity, the number of references on the paper, the more homogeneous, the lower the impact factor and the lower the uh, citation percentile. There's this lovely study by Haynes and colleagues from 2020 that highlights uh, a impact of gender diversity. It's not really biomedical science, but it's just a nice dark demonstration. Um, there was um, a dominant uh, or study of bird song that was in male dominated in this uh, component of ornithology. And there was a dominant paradigm about what the bird song was like based upon observed patterns, primarily studying male birds. And it was found that as female scientists joined the field, uh, they looked more broadly, they looked at male and female birds and the dominant paradigm was subverted. And then there's this lovely study from PNIS in January that looked at some 5, mil 5 million studies uh, that were published uh, and looked at um, the uh, types of things that got published by race ethnicity. Uh, what you see here is white men, Black men, Latino males, uh, Asian men, Asian women, Latinas, Black women, and white women. And as you can see from the heat maps, there are differing patterns with the Latinas, Black women, and white women publishing much less in engineering, technology, mathematics, and physics, and much more in health, psychology, and the arts, and almost a converse pattern for the white men, Black men, and Latinos, uh, something in between for Asian men and women. Uh, and yes, the authors observed that the women published less than the men, leading to the conclusion that a different body of knowledge would be produced in the absence of inequities. Uh, and they make the value judgment that this body would be would more closely reflect the spectrum of top topics relevant across society, I think, because there's so much in the way of health research that the women did. They make recommendations for resources for historically underfunded research areas, health disparities being among the things in the health research and the importance of connecting scientists from underrepresented groups uh, who tend to get more highly published um, because of high prestige networks and topics as has been alluded to. And we know that we are not taking advantage of the full uh, uh, pool of talent that's out there. This represents in dark blue R01 
awardees from NIH in orange, the representation of the STEM workforce, in green, the representation in the US population. And as you can see, non-Hispanic whites and Asians are pretty well represented, but Hispanic Latinos, Blacks and African-Americans, there's some opportunity for enhancement and taking advantage of more creativity. And as it has been shown in multiple slides previously, we see as you move through professoriate, you go from underrepresented women, well-represented women, underrepresented men, well-represented men, you know, with the distribution that's you know, actually a little bit more among women than men, to the department chair level where there's not nearly as much representation and great opportunities for enhancement there. We as well did our surveys uh, during the pandemic. We just did one cross-sectional survey uh, in the fall of uh, 2020. We did, well, in the summer of 2020, we looked at our own staff and you see summarized here uh, the exec executive findings from that. But then in the fall of 2020, we made outreach to vice presidents of research and their equivalents um, in the top uh, funded institutions, uh, NIH funded institutions. Uh, we also made outreach to individuals who had interacted with the NIH ERA Commons systems uh, in the prior um, two years. So it's clearly those people who are interested in NIH funding have interacted with us for funding. Um, whether it's a trainee or an R01 recipient, whatever. And we got a really robust response, about 47,000 uh, scientists responded to that. Some of the highlights are referable to issues with regards to women in science. In particular, it was found that women found it substantially more difficult to complete their work responsibilities and had more in the way of negative mental and physical um, impact on their productivity than men. Although it was very interestingly, the men and women anticipate were equally anxious about their career, career trajectory at that time. Uh, when you looked at the type of caregiving, and again, caregiving tends to fall more heavily on women. Uh, if you were taking care of small children versus school-aged children versus older adults or disabled adults, um, there were differences in uh, perceived productivity, in uh, outlook on career trajectory, on the impact on making things more difficult and on mental health. And you might note that uh, here, the impact on mental health is equivalent if you're taking care of a small child or an older adult. As a geriatrician, it's very evident to me that uh, during the pandemic, uh, the height of the pandemic, it was very difficult taking care of a frail older adult, whether they were frail physically or mentally with a Alzheimer's or other sort of dementia because the support systems that people had previously availed themselves of were not readily available. And those older adults tended to deteriorate very rapidly as a result of lack of stimulation and access. What did we do? Um, we have the childcare costs for training awards that were announced in um, the spring of last year. We extended eligibility for F and K awards last spring. Uh, we extended eligibility for early stage investigator status even before that, because we could see what was happening with the pandemic. Uh, and we now have a standing expectation of identifying and publicizing resources for childcare and other types of family care associated with conference awards that we provide. But that's certainly not enough. Uh, and we continue to evaluate the uh, data and consider our policy. I am recurrently uh, assured by Dr. Mike Lauer, who runs the Office of Extramural Research at NIH, that we do not yet see a decrease in the applications uh, by women for R01 equivalent grants as compared to prior to the pandemic. But again, um, what we see versus what might be seen locally at institutions will likely be different because we see it across the country. What else are we doing? Well, we have a notice of special interests of diversity that came out in 2019 and, and we define diversity broadly. We look at individuals from racial and ethnic groups that have been shown by the NICES National Science Foundation to be underrepresented in health related sciences on a national basis. We look at individuals with disabilities, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds. If you looked at this NOSI, you've seen that there are multiple criteria that can meet that uh, expectation. You have to have two of them basically uh, speaking to coming from a so low socioeconomic background, like being on food stamps or Pell Grants or whatever. 
and women at the graduate level and beyond, given the lack of representation that you can see as people move forward. Uh, and we have about 90 diversity funding opportunity announcements currently active at NIH. I would also bring to your attention um, this article that was published at Nation, Nature Communications at the end of last month, uh, done collaboratively with my colleagues, Kelly Ten Tenhagen, uh, Carrie Walnuts, Jean Janine Clayton, Director of the Office of Research in, in Women's Health, and myself, to talk about inclusive excellence, particularly for women scientists, uh, kind of responding to a rather negative uh, Nature Comms article a few months before about women and mentoring, and making the point that it needs to be a system. I think that's been mentioned by the other speakers. There have to be enhanced flexibility and options for women because of work life balance issues, there need to be cultures of inclusive inclusion. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of one of our cohort hiring FOAs. There needs to be dem demonstrable leadership support, such as the statement made by Francis Collins of no longer being willing to participate in mantles. Uh, there, need to, there needs to be action-oriented accountability, as Dr. Brown spoke to, you know, the opportunity to report issues with regards to harassment and to know that there will be something done about that. And there needs to be research interventions and best practices, such as the causal factors uh, research portfolio from the Office of Research and Women's Health, the recent prize to recognize um, uh, institutional best practices in uh, diversity, particularly gender diversity. In addition, we have uh, what is called the NIH Unite Initiative that was unveiled a little more than a year ago with the very ambitious goal of stopping or ending structural racism. Why? Because we saw all of us in the spring of 2020, the disproportionate morbidity and mortality for African-Americans, Blacks, uh, Hispanics, Latinos, American Indians. Um, and we all saw the violence of that summer, um, particularly the videotape murder of George Floyd. Uh, just after we unveiled the initiative, we saw the killings of six Asian women in Atlanta. Uh, all of this brought into sharp relief for us at NIH, the ongoing reality of racial and ethnic injustice in our country, and a sense that we could not be silent. We needed to do things to address structural racism in the biomedical research enterprise, and we have something of a bully pul pulpit to help with that. So uh, February 26 of 2021, we unveiled the NIH Unite Initiative, focusing on health disparities research, looking at our own internal workforce, getting our um, house in order to role model what we expect of the external workforce. And just a few highlights. We have a common fund initiative on transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity, committing almost $60 million over the next five years. Uh, six awards uh, were given uh, with fiscal year 21 funds for that topic in general, another five for that topic at minority serving institutions. And there's another competition on um, this fiscal year for additional funds there. And there'll be a new common fund initiative next fiscal year that'll be even broader. Looking internally, we're doing a lot of things, but I'd just like to share with you one project that uh, is really a lovely uh, uh, concept. Dr. Sadana Jackson, shown here, uh, is a tenure-track early career scientist at NIH and speaks very eloquently about walking through the halls of NIH and not seeing people who reflect her. Uh, and this project is meant to bring together representation of everyone who's necessary for success in the biomedical enterprise. Early career scientists, later career scientists, non-scientists, um, the colors and the patterns represent the richness of that variety. Um, and it's been very inspiring to a lot of our staff. And then looking externally, uh, we have a funding opportunity announcement called FIRST, Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. It's meant to create cultures of inclusive excellence across the country. Uh, it's built on cohort modeling, on, on cohort hiring, uh, bringing in groups of scientists uh, for multi-level mentoring and professional development. Uh, addressing institutional climate, bias, faculty equity, mentoring, work-life issues. And in the initial solicitation, we called for a coordination and evaluation center. And we're committing, uh, approaching $250 million over the next nine years. These are the first six awardees, high resource institutions, low resource institutions, a collaboration between Tuskegee and University of Alabama and Birmingham, 
Morehouse School of Medicine is the coordinating center. And at the end of this, we will have at least 14 different cohorts across the country, 140 faculty. And again, we're thinking broadly in diversity. Um, it's women, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, uh, and other forms of diversity. There's so much going on, I can't tell you all of it in the time that we have, but I would encourage you to Google NIH Unite and look at our milestones and future directions. Um, and I will, um, I have to show you my last slide. I don't know why that didn't come up initially. I'll close with our favorite uh, tagline, great minds think differently. It's really important to have those different perspectives to get good science. So, thank you. Thank you, Rita, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernard. I'm going to turn it over to Drs. Nock and Aisha Siebert to lead our q and I know there's some questions uh, that were already uh, in the box, but if people have any other questions, feel free to uh, chat it in or raise your hand. Great. Uh, well, maybe I can get started with the first question and Aisha take the, take the next uh, one. Um, uh, but one of the uh, attendings on the call, um, Ariana asked um, that as a trainee, one of the biggest deterrents is noticing a lack of supportive and understanding thesis advisors, or in other words, advisors who are not great at uh, ment mentorship. So how is it possible to go about solving that issue, especially as it relates to uh, women and underrepresented minorities um, in, 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 in uh, improving uh, inclusion? Uh, I'll take a, sure. Yeah, I'll take a crack at that. So I, I think this is one of the reasons that we have put oversight of mentorship as a key element of all of our career development programs. Um, where an associate dean or somebody like that is meeting with trainees, obviously in the MD-PhD program, the director of the program is meeting regularly with trainees. And if you do that, you start to see patterns and you start to recognize those people whose mentorship skills are not what they should be and who could either benefit from coaching or just frankly should not be mentors. I think that's a very important element of, of the leadership of these programs. And I'd like to just jump in and say that we recognize that uh, mentorship is really important. We also recognize it's not really usually well compensated or compensated at all. Um, so as part of this NIH Unite initiative, we are working on a uh, funding opportunity announcement. It was approved in the uh, an open council meetings. So I can talk about this to uh, have a mentoring award. And in fact, we have a notice of special interest in administrative supplements to recognize excellence in DEIA mentoring um, that closes in a couple of days, but we have had such a robust response from the scientific community signaling to us that there's a real need out there. It's not recognized. Um, so we are going to be working hard to do more of that recognition um, and hopefully that will be helpful. So the best piece of advice I ever received in graduate school was choose your mentor, not your project. Um, I think many of us come into science because we're passionate about a particular topic and we're really excited to work on something new and hot. Um, but, but I think really doing your homework and finding a good mentor is so important. So um, I think upfront, that's a really important message to get across to trainees who are choosing their PhD labs, their postdoc labs, et cetera. But if you're in a lab and um, you're already situated and, and maybe the mentorship's not ideal, um, I think that you can also reach out and um, develop a mentor committee uh, so that other faculty can provide, you know, different aspects of mentorship as well. Um, and so that can be helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, about a topic, Dr. Rue, that you, that you touched on and, and Jennifer as well, um, specifically um, childcare um, and how that can be a very large financial burden, especially for trainees um, and particularly with the pandemic, that responsibility is falling disproportionately on female trainees. So um, uh, two uh, attendees asked about institutional initiatives to make childcare more accessible for trainees and young faculty. Um, and. Uh, how institutions across the country have or, or perhaps have not been offering these sort of resources to manage um, existing um, uh, need on campus. Uh, 
To whom did you direct that? I'm sorry, Asia. Um, it's a, uh, to anyone who would like to address it, but um, Dr. Wu, um, I know that you touched on this a little bit, uh, if you could share your perspective on, on, on this question. Sure, I think um, childcare is a challenge in general. Um, and, and if we're gonna have women advance um, in medicine and science as a society, we need to find better solutions. But I think at the institutional levels, um, at Stanford, like many institutions provided uh, childcare grants. Uh, we had a program in coordination with Bright Horizons, which is a childcare provider uh, to try to provide childcare. But, but even then, um, uh, during the course of the pandemic, we had listening groups with our faculty oh. to hear what was going on. And, uh, and child care came up again and again. And uh, one of the things that happened was that money was part of the problem, but not all of it. Um, and it, especially with many child care facilities closing or the fluctuating COVID requirements. Um, so even when there was money, there were many people who could not find child care providers. Um, and so I think we need sort of systemic uh, address ways to address these problems, you know, to increase child care in general. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernard, you mentioned that there, um, there are some new RFAs specifically addressed at child care needs. Could you speak more to some of those initiatives? So that's associated with uh, conference grants that NIH gives out. Um, if one is to get a conference grant these days, you have to indicate what the child care options are. That's part of the review criteria. Um, so that's an advance from my viewpoint, certainly as compared to when I had small children. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, Dr. Bernard, there was another question about resources to improve retention of underrepresented minorities and women. And so I know you uh, touched about that a little bit with the UNITE initiative. Are there other initiatives nationwide that you might know of um, that underrepresented minorities and women can apply for to, to receive funding or protect their research time or advocate for their efforts to their own institutions? So one of the uh, opportunities that I think is really underutilized at NIH, um, there was a JAMA internal medicine article that did an analysis over the last decade of diversity supplements. Uh, divert people are eligible for diversity supplements if they meet one of those uh, areas that is considered an uh, area of interest in diversity, as I shared, women beyond the graduate level, people from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, the person living with disabilities or coming from a uh, socioeconomically uh, deprived background. Um, and in that analysis, it was shown that from 2011 through to 2021, there was an increase in diversity supplements at NIH, but still only about 4.5% of R01 grants have a diversity supplement associated with them. And it's a great way of facilitating uh, research for um, scientists from very early career through to even, you know, early uh, assistant professors. In my role, in my other life as the deputy director of the National Institute on Aging, we did a couple of longitudinal analyses of diversity supplement recipients. Um, it's hard to do uh, because once, until very recently, after the first year of getting the supplement, uh, the mechanism kind of goes away and you have to really do some detective work to find the scientists. But what we found with a lot of heavy lifting by our staff is that our diversity supplement recipients were very successful. It was a great way in many cases of getting people started with their careers, going on to be on our own national advisory committee, one of our division directors, et cetera. So that's something I would really encourage people to think about. And I see Dr. Brown has some input. Do just those supplements also oh just to emphasize the importance of doing this um locally as well you know i think sometimes we we look solely to the nih for support but um making these things a priority one can find money uh to, to support these groups i'd also like to highlight the doris duke charitable foundation has the fund to retain clinical scientists and um, it's um, a program that institutions can apply for funding. Um, so to both um, Dr. Brown and Dr. Bernard's points that there are different sources of funding um, addressing these very important issues. 
Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, here's a question for um, Dean Brown, um, Isabel Bazan, who I believe we are um, med school classmates. Nice to see you. Um, she says she appreciates the um, acknowledgement that mentorship and sponsorship and protective time in early career um, are not provided proportionally or equitably to all groups. Is there a way that we can be more transparent about how, uh, who and how these opportunities are offered uh, to and to improve recruitment and retention in general through public, public awareness of these kinds of opportunities? So I think it, it, it has to come from uh, institutional leadership. And, and so as we have thought about um, how we promote diversity, uh, we, in our, for example, in our vision for um, our first program, have a, not just the mentor and the mentorship committee, but an assigned sponsor who is a senior leader in the department of the faculty member, whose role is really that uh, networking. And, and, and then the third um, extremely important role that we have is an inclusion ambassador. Um, you know, I think that, uh, having a community of people who have faced the same challenges is extremely important. And I use the example that, you know, when a, when a woman goes to, is thinking about networking or how I build my career, if she has that conversation in um, a, a group of women, inevitably the question she asks is, what do I do about traveling with young children? And, and people in the room have had the experience and offer all sorts of very valuable advice. And similarly, if someone who is underrepresented in medicine is asked to serve on their 10th committee and they bring that to a group of colleagues who have all had that same experience, they get pragmatic advice on how you say no or how you choose the committees on which you serve. And so that's another um, aspect of this support group that we're surrounding our faculty with. So it's mentorship, sponsorship, and then this community that creates inclusivity. Thank you. Um, and this is a sort of related follow on question. Um, you, you mentioned the importance of sponsorship and advocacy from from leadership. What efforts are underway nationally to improve representation of women in um, URMs in upper leadership at medical schools to to create more resources for for people that are early in their career? I think there are some wonderful leadership development programs, um, you know, some through the AAMC, for example. Um, the ELAM program, Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine, is a terrific program for women. And um, the, the content of those programs are they're focused on leadership development, but um, often address these kinds of issues. How do you as a leader promote uh, in, an inclusive environment? Robert Wood Johnson as well, I would mention. Uh, Amos. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Bernard, this question was uh, was addressed at the NIH, but has the NIH or any of the other institutions uh, on this call looked at the degree to which student loan burden also plays a role in some of the gender and racial uh, inequities among faculty that we discussed today? Yeah, we're very sensitive to the fact that uh, loan burden is a barrier for many groups and it tends to be disproportionately, uh, particularly underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, uh, scientists. Uh, and the um, degrees of freedom that we have um, to provide uh, more support are basically dictated by Congress, uh, but we're really excited that the amount that can be put towards a loan repayment has been increased recently. Again, recognize it's not, particularly if you're a physician scientist, uh, a surgeon, for instance, like you, <laughs> it's, it's hard to uh, uh, fully compensate for the, um, uh, funds that you could potentially generate from clinical activities uh, purely, um, but we do the best we can and continue to look at and acknowledge that this can be a barrier. Thanks. All right. Uh, I think we're already over the hour because we have such wonderful discussion here. Uh, but it sounds like some of our speak, uh, our attendees are interested in the PowerPoint. So we'll ask our uh, speakers if they're okay, if we are, we are able to share some of those PowerPoints uh, with those who are interested. Uh, but I wanna thank all our attendees and our speakers today for a wonderful discussion and highlighting the landscape. Uh, but also 
op, you know, optimistic to hear all the solutions and the proposals that are going on, all the efforts that NIH has put forward to support and address some of these disparities. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for attending, and feel free to reach out with any questions or suggestions. Um, we're going to continue this discussion in Chicago um, on Friday. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care.